This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Uh, this is the second lecture on Chapter 24 of the free course notes. Uh, and um, if you remember, we're, we've been looking at the consolidated statement of profit and loss. Now, uh, in the previous lecture, we looked at uh, we worked through two examples. But at the end of the previous lecture, I did say there's just one problem that can occur. And it's really the same problem we dealt with on statement of financial position uh, regarding inter-entity trading. Uh, and if you remember from statements of financial position, inter-entity inter trading is where one of the two companies is selling to the other company, which creates a little problem. Well, let me show you what I mean and how we deal with it with example three. P acquired 55% of S on the 1st of June 2008. The statements of profit or loss of the two companies for the year ended 31st of May 2009 are as follows. And it's all pretty normal there, revenue, cost of sales and so on. However, uh, the sentence at the bottom says, during the year, S sold goods to P for 28000 so including in S's sales, a 28,000 is sold to P, and surely including in, uh, in P's cost of sales will be the 28,000 they were charged from S. Uh, one quarter of these goods remained in P's inventory at the year end. Well, that last, uh, those last two sentences create two problems for us. One, I think, is... Um, very easily dealt with and should be very logical. Uh, the other problem needs slightly more thought, but let me show you as we work through. Uh, the consolidated statement, first of all, the revenue. As always, we just add the two together, 120 plus 110. However, we only want to show revenue from outside the group and of course, S's revenue of 110 will include, in their own statements, it will include those sales to, uh, to P of 28,000. So surely to get the revenue from outside the group, we need to take off that 28,000, which gives us revenue from outside of 120 plus 110 minus 28. 202,000. What about the cost of sales? Again, P 55,000, uh, S 50,000. But again, that's how much they've recorded in their own statements of profit or loss. Uh, for the group, we want to show cost from outside the group. But surely, P's costs of 55 will include everything they bought from S. And S, remember, was charging them 28, so the cost to P was 28. To get the, rev uh, the cost from outside the group, again, take out the 28,000. And that would leave us... Uh, with a cost of 77. Now, in a minute, there is one extra problem. I'm going to need to change this, as you'll see. Uh, but certainly, if there are any intergroup sales, take the amount off the revenue and take the amount off the cost of sales, and that would have left us with a gross profit of 5108. 125,000. Now think about that for a minute. Um, if you look at the individual gross profits, P and S, P was making 65, S was making 60, the total 125,000. Uh, and so, so far, we haven't changed the profit at all. It's just to show that for better presentation, we only want to show 
transactions outside the group, the outside sales, the revenue, the outside cost of sales. We took 28,000 from both. All right, that deals with the sale between the two. But the other thing is this business that some of the goods remained in inventory. And because without repeating everything I said when we did the statements of financial position in relation to this, in the intercompany sales, at the moment, S has taken profit on what they sold to P. And provided those goods uh, were then sold by P outside, then that's fine. We're entitled to take the profit provided they were all sold outside. And so if there had been no, uh, none of these left in inventory, then what we've done is fine and we'd carry on as normal. The trouble is that some of those goods, one quarter of them, are still in P's inventory. S had taken profit for all of those uh, sales to P, but we can't take profit on the group statement. We can't take profit for any that remain in inventory. It's unrealized profit. And so on the statement of financial position, if you remember the inventory, we needed to take out S's profit to show it at cost to the group. And similarly, when we were doing retained earnings, the unrealized profit had to be removed because the group as a whole hadn't sold them outside, hadn't made the profit. Well, at the moment, that 125,000 includes all of, P's, uh, of S's profit. Uh, we need to remove the profit that's included in these goods in inventory. And so let's calculate the provision for unrealized profit. Uh, the perp, and I shouldn't need to go on too long here because we did spend time on it before in the lectures on statement of financial position. But uh, during the year, they sold goods of 28,000. One quarter of those are in inventory. So uh, the selling price from S of the goods in inventory was 7,000. But that includes the markup that S has charged. And so how much markup, how much profit is included in that 7,000? Well, we went through it before, but still. For every $100 cost, they'll have added on a profit of 40%. They'll be selling at 140. And so as far as S is concerned, for every 140 selling price, they'll have been making a profit of 40. Well, the uh, goods left in inventory, 7,000 was S's selling price, and therefore the profit included, the unrealized profit, 40 for every 140 of that 7,000 which I should be able to do in my head, but I'm scared. 40 divided by 140 times 7,000 is 2,000. And I said when we were doing step to financial position, be confident, don't waste time checking, but I can see there it checks. The uh, S was selling for seven. It included a profit of two, so the cost to S was five. 40% of 5 is 2,000. And so, well, that's the unrealized profit. And again, at the moment, the total profit we've got there of 125,000 includes the, uh, all of S's profit on everything they've sold, including all the goods sold to P. We're not allowed for the group as a whole we don't want to show that 2,000 unrealized profit. And so our profit needs to be 2,000 less. 
Well, how are we going to deal with it? The way we deal with it is this. In order to reduce the profit, to take out that 2,000, we increase the cost of sales. We add the 2,000 provision for unrealised profit. That makes the cost of sales 2,000 higher, that's 79,000. And if the cost of sales is 2,000 higher, the profit, the gross profit, will be 2,000 lower. So that's the way we deal with it. The profit, we have to take out the profit, the unrealised profit on, on the closing inventory. Again, you can see from the two statements, the two gross profits, 65 and 60, a total of 125. We've got to take out that 2,000. The pro gross profit is 123. Again, the way we achieve it is by adding the unrealised profit to the cost of sales. Uh, now we can carry on as normal. Expenses. Uh, 9 plus 10, 19,000. Uh, giving a profit before tax. Uh, 123 less 19 is um, 104,000. Uh, the tax, 20 plus 14 is 34. Uh, and so the final profit for the year uh, 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 70,000. Uh, which, again, if you look, the two net profits added together are 72,000. Uh, for the consolidated uh, statement, the profit is 2,000 less because of this unrealized profit. Uh, finally, who's it attributable to? Uh, we need to split, if you remember, between shares of the uh, P, the, the parent company, and the non-controlling interest. And I said before that rather than mess around, always we simply take the total, which is 70,000. Uh, we calculate the amount attributable to the non-controlling interest. The amount attributable to the shelves of P is the, uh, the missing figure of the balance. Well, the non-controlling interest, um, P acquired 55% of S, so the non-controlling interest own 45%, 100 minus 55. And so they're entitled to that share of S's profit S's profit was 36, but remember, since it was S who'd sold this, these goods, of which there's inventory, since it was S who'd sold to P, it's S who'd taken credit for the profit, including the unrealised profit. So again, we need to take out the unrealised profit of 2,000. As far as the consolidation is concerned, that only leaves 34 realised profit. And so the non-controlling interest, 45% of the remaining 34,000, 15,300. The rest of it belongs to shares of P, so 70,000. Minus fifteen thousand three hundred fifty four seven hundred, and there we are. And so it's those two effects. Any uh, intercompany sales take the total amount from re uh, away from revenue and the total amount away from um, the cost of sales. If um, any of them are left in inventory. Calculate the provision for unrealized profit and remove it. Well, sorry, two things, I beg your pardon. Add it 
to the cost of sales in order to reduce the, gro the total gross profit. And when you calculate the non-controlling interest, if it was the subsidiary that had sold the goods initially uh, to the parent, then you need to remove the uh, unrealized profit from the subsidiary's profit. But remember, same as with certain financial position, had it been the parent who'd sold the goods to the subsidiary, then again, cost of sales would have increased by 2,000 to reduce the profit. But had it been the parent who'd sold to the subsidiary, it would be the parent who'd taken credit for that profit, not the subsidiary. And therefore the subsidiary, the non-controlling interest, uh, would be 45% of the full 36,000. Anyway, there we are. Again, it's the same problem we had with central financial position, so there's not really anything new. Um, it's more a question of the presentation. All right, so that's everything we need for the, um, certainly for this exam, for the statement of profit or loss. There is one more chapter, but no calculations involved. Uh, just a few, few further points that you're expected to be aware of, but that'll be the next lecture.